Welcome to the Faith Dialogue Podcast with your host, Pastor Ken Baer. Are you ready to swim in the deep end of the Bible pool or climb to the top of Faith Mountain? If so, open the eyes that see, those ears that hear, and a heart that is receptive. Get your cup of coffee and your Bible as we begin. to hear from you. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that we share. We thank you, Lord, for, um, for our relationship with you. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 So we have been going through the book of Ephesians, and we're now in chapter 6, which is the end of the book of Ephesians. And I wanted to cut it off last week where we did before we get into the whole armor of God. Sometimes... Uh, the whole armor of God is a completely different uh, topic. It seems like Paul has been taking us through the book of Ephesians and has building, and then we've got this whole armor of God, and uh, it, it kind of stands on its own. So we're going to kind of take it through today, uh, see what the Lord has to say with, to us about uh, spiritual warfare, and we'll go from there. So let me, let me read it to you, and, uh, and we'll just, uh, just take it verse by verse. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10. Finally, my brethren. Don't you know that when pastors say finally, they're almost done with their sermon? You ever, you ever notice that? I mean, I do that. Sometimes I'll say finally, and I realize, I look at the clock and realize I'm still talking for another 15, 20 minutes. I was say. Yeah, I, I, I shouldn't have said finally because I, I know I've got, I'm going to be talking for another 15 minutes. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on a breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith which, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perse perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that, I, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And then Paul concludes, he says, but that you may also know my affairs and how I am doing. Ticlius, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the, in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So what we're, we're this, this, this end of Ephesians 6 is talking about the armor of God, but the broader picture that it's talking about is this idea of, of spiritual warfare, of understanding that, that we're not alone in this world, that there is more to what the eye can see. You know, the Bible says that, that everything that you can see, everything that you can touch, everything that you can feel that, that interacts with your six senses, everything that you see is all temporary. It's all subject to change. Regardless of how tall you build a building, eventually time and wind and rain and whatever else will, will bring it back down. It's like building sand, sand castles on the shore. No matter what you try to, to build, eventually it'll go away. Everything that we can see is subject to change. The Bible says instead, focus your, focus your intentions on things that are eternal. Because the things that you can't see are those things that are eternal. They never change. And this passage of scripture in Ephesians 6 takes us into that realm. It doesn't say it specifically, but it gets you there anyway. Because when it talks about that we stand against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this darkness, and that's in verse 12, that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about that there are things that you can't see that nevertheless are very real. 
Now, here's the point. Here's the, here's the point. And I've been in all kinds of churches, and I've heard all kinds of sermons, but there's, there's two things I'll say about this idea of spiritual warfare, of the idea of looking at those things that are unseen. Typically, everybody falls into one of two camps. Either they don't think about it enough, they pass it off as something that is not important, and they don't focus on it at all, and then the other camp seems to focus on it all the time. You know, it's like the devil made me do it. No matter what happens, no matter what happens to you. Do you know people like that? I, there's people that, that I've known. They're good people. Don't get me wrong. They're wonderful people. They love the Lord. But they're constantly calling me because they're constantly under some kind of a spiritual attack. And it could be that the washing machine isn't working that day. It doesn't seem like it matters what it is, no matter what it is that's confronting them that day. It's, it's got to be a spiritual attack. The devil is out to get them. You know, they were preparing a dinner for their husband. You know, their husband's been gone and wouldn't you know it, but the oven didn't work. Or the, the pot that they were going to use is, is missing. They, whatever it is, it's a, it's a spiritual attack for them. And, and here's the thing. I think that in between the idea of we don't want to pay attention to it at all. The only thing that we care about are the things that we can see. We just don't pay any attention at all to spiritual things or to, to things we can't see. And to the people that I talk about, that everything to them is a spiritual attack. There's a lot of room in the middle. And that's where I think we need to be. I think that's where we need to be. I think we need to be aware, and we can be aware by just reading some of the Old Testament, uh, some of the things that Jesus did. Um, you can pick up the Bible. It doesn't take too long before you see some of this, these powers, these unknown, these unknown forces that whether we call them principalities or powers or 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 those things present. Hi, Talitha. Come on in. So it doesn't take us too long, and we'll we'll come across them. So our job, I think, is to try to figure out well, what does that mean for us? What, where, what does that mean for us? How are we supposed to? To, uh, to be talking to them. Um, the Apostle Paul instructs Christians to wage war against the sin in themselves. That's Romans 6. You know, so often that the devil that made you do it is really nothing more than, than yourself. It's, it's the things inside you that are confounding you. If, if you feel that you're being tempted, remember that a lot of temptation are the sins of the flesh. They're, they're things that inside you. It isn't so much somebody whispering in your ear telling you. You know, that, that, I guess we haven't seen that as much anymore. I remember growing up as a kid, just as a kid, watching regular cartoons, Looney Tunes, it always seemed like it wouldn't take too long before I would see a little good angel and a little bad angel. Remember that? A good angel on somebody's shoulder and a bad angel on the other shoulder, and they would kind of whisper at each other, and they kind of whisper in your ear, and the good angel was telling you to do good things, and the bad angel was telling you to do bad things. You don't see that much anymore. And I don't know whether it's the, the secularization of society, or maybe we've just done that too much. But, but that, with, that's the kind of idea that somehow that there's, there's spiritual forces out there, and the Bible is very clear on that. There's spiritual forces out there that are, that are trying to do everything they possibly can to disrupt the will of God. And I think that's one of the points, before we get into this verse by verse, the things that the spiritual forces are trying to do is disrupt the power of God and the flow of God and the plans of God. So here's the thing. If you're outside of the plans of God, if, if really what you're doing really has very little to do with the the plans of the kingdom of God, then I wouldn't worry too much about the devil because the devil doesn't really care too much about you. Right. He's already got you. He, he's got you just where, I mean, if, if the devil can make you believe that he doesn't exist, he's already won. He doesn't have to do anything to you. So I remember years ago, uh, Carol and I were at, a, uh, were at a conference and it was really interesting because the, the evangelist was very, very good. He was, he was very, very good and very emotional, and he was very persuasive. And Carol and I kept on getting on the edge of our seats because we felt that God was, was really calling us, really calling us. And what was interesting was that he said that, here's the thing, God's calling some of you to the front lines, just like the Army has uh, the Green Beret and the Navy has the SEALs, you know, and all the branches of service have the very, very best, the elite, the people that are the highest trained, okay? 
And, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for Christians that want to be that elite, want to be part of that army, that, that salvation army, let it be. And so, yeah, we want to do that. He said, well, here's the thing. He says, they're the ones that meet the enemy. And it's like, whoa, I, I don't know if I want to meet the enemy. I don't, I don't mind getting, doing some training. You know, I don't mind being trained up and built up and being prepared, but I don't know if I want to go into battle. Because battle is where you, 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 you can you get some damage done. There's some, some difficulties. So in that, that's exactly what Paul is, Paul is talking about. Paul's trying to get us prepared to understand that there are battles. And that if you're a faithful Christian and you're doing what God wants you to do, there's going to be opportunity to run into the spiritual forces, those that oppose the will of God. So let's take a look at it kind of verse by verse. And anybody wants to jump in, you're always welcome to. So it says, Paul starts off kind of, it's kind of like a, a neutral, okay? Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Then he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now he's going to define this armor of the Lord in a second, but he tells us first why we want to do this. It's like, why do you want to put your armor on? Why, why do you want to do that? And Paul's giving us some reasons on why we want to do that. Verse 12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, there has been some people I've seen that have tried to define these individual categories, you know, that, that the principalities are different than powers. And the principalities and powers are different than the rulers of the darkness of this age. And then there's also spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I don't make that distinction. I just don't think there's enough specificity in the Bible to define exactly who these, these people are or exactly what their, what their role is. However, I do want to... I do want to call attention to you some passages from the Old Testament that Paul was aware of and his readers in Ephesians were aware of. So I want to take you to just a couple of scripture verses. Um, since I've mentioned the Old Testament, I'll take that first. There's a, there's a passage in the book of Daniel. We've mentioned the book of Daniel. When we did that prophecy series, uh, we mentioned the book of Daniel because if you understand Daniel, it's a lot easier to understand prophecy. And in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel chapter 10, Daniel receives a very troubling vision regarding a great war. And he's trying to figure out what it means. So he starts praying. He starts praying and fasting. In fact, it says for 21 days, he didn't, he didn't anoint himself, which means he didn't take a bath, okay? Didn't anoint himself, didn't perfume himself. He was just on his feet, on his face before God, and he was fasting. So he was eating enough to survive, but he wasn't eating anything good. He was just kind of munching on beans and rice and whatever it is. In fact, there's a thing called a Daniel fast that some churches have done, and it's based on this chapter in Daniel where you take 21 days and you basically fast and you pray. And you sustain yourself, but you don't sustain yourself with really good stuff. No cakes, no ice creams, nothing really good. You just kind of beans and rice and some bread and whatever it is. So that, that's the Daniel fast. <laughs> so anyway, Dan Daniel had this very difficult, difficult vision, and he starts praying. And for 21 days, he prays that he doesn't get an answer from God. And then there's an amazing thing that's mentioned in Daniel, starting in verse 12. And I'll just read it to you. And it's going to seem a little odd, but listen to what it says. Then an angel appears to Daniel. And he says, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Now that makes me feel good. That makes me feel that God heard me when I started praying. Your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days. Let that settle in for a minute. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. 
for I have been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. So here is an angel. We think it might be Gabriel. Let's not mention who it is. It might be Gabriel. But Gabriel is often sent by God to dispatch and give a message. So it could be Gabriel, but it's not mentioned. But the angel Michael is mentioned. Now we know that Michael is one of the few archangels. He's mentioned a few times in the Bible as like being one of the chief angels. And here's an example. In fact, there's, a, there's, a, there's another scripture uh, verse that talks about that Michael fights for Israel. Michael has a special, God has a special heart for Israel, and Michael's kind of like in charge. So Michael is the archangel that's in charge to make sure that God's plans for Israel go according to plan. But there's obviously some, there's, there's some opposition here. So Daniel gets a revelation from God. Daniel's trying to understand the revelation. Michael is dispatched by God to, not, no, Michael, I'm sorry, Dan, uh, most likely Gabriel is dispatched by God, but somehow up in the heavenlies, something that we can't see, there's this prince of Persia, this angel, this fallen angel of some kind, with, and it looks like with some hordes because, because it says that um, I've been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So he's talking about that. It isn't just this, this one, but it's, it's a number of heavenly hosts that are thwarting the ability of the angel to get to Daniel. And then Michael comes and praises him. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that'll, just that verse alone will change your opinion of what's going on in spiritual, in spiritual things. In 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter tells us, he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. In Revelation 12, starting in verse 7, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his, angel, and dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down after him. So regardless of, of your eschatology, which means the study of the last things, regardless of your eschatology, there's something going on. Whether this has already happened in the past or it's going to happen in the future, there's something going on here. And it has to do with exactly this idea of spiritual warfare. So now when we go back and take a look at the book of Ephesians, and it says, and Paul says, finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord. Put on the whole armor of God. We need to pay attention because there's, there's something that's very, very real out there, are things that we can't see. Verse 13 says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. So, if the Bible says, or if somebody told you to take the whole thing, okay, like you ever have a doctor or a nurse tell you that you, you got to take some medicine, and the medicine doesn't taste real good, you know, and you take, eh, it doesn't, doesn't really taste real good, and you say, how much of this do I need to take? And they say, you got to take the whole thing. Got to take the whole thing. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I'm going to give you kind of a description, okay, not necessarily a prescription. There's a difference between a prescription and a description, right? Description kind of generally tells you how this all fits together. Prescription is kind of very, very exact. And I think this armor of God is more of a description rather than a prescription. But he's going to give a description of some armor. But what he's saying is this. He says, I want you to take the whole thing, okay? Don't just take one of these things and feel that you're, you're working out pretty good. It's kind of like, because you've, you've read this before. We've read this. It's kind, of like a, it's kind of like the armor for a Roman soldier, right? And we've all seen pictures of Roman soldiers. We've all seen, you know, movies of, of Roman soldiers walking around. Well, imagine some Roman soldiers walking around, but he doesn't have his breastplate on, or he doesn't have his helmet on, or he's, he's walking around, he doesn't have a sword. It's like, where'd my sword go? You know? It's like, no, you, you got to have it all because it comes together as a package. You're not sure exactly what you're going to need at any given time, but you better have it all because there's all going to be different kinds of ways that they're going to come against you, going to come against you, and you're going to need these things for different, different purposes. 
So Paul, in verse 14, is going to get into the descriptions of this armor of God. And he says this. He says, stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. So we'll stop there. Girded your waist with truth. So one of the first things that the soldier, my understanding the soldiers had to do, and I've never been a Roman soldier, never was. Well, I guess I was when I was a kid. I think there was a Halloween. I kind of went out as a Roman soldier and had one of these little costumes. And my, uh, my son, by the way, so you guys know my son. Uh, my, son, my son will be here, by the way, at the end of the month because it's my mom's birthday. Now, my son is 39 years old, so don't remind him of this when you see him. But when he was like seven or eight years old, we had a Christian bookstore. My wife and I ran a Christian bookstore. And um, one of the things we sold was a kid's outfit called the Armor of God. And it came in a little box. You probably saw it. A little, little box. came in a little plastic box. It had a little helmet, a little sword. It had a little breastplate and little things for your, your feet and stuff like that. And my daughter loved to dress up her little brother in this armor of God. And we'd be in the front of the store talking to customers and everything. And then my son would be coming out of the back room, you know, and with this <laughs> big smile on his face. And he's got the armor of God on. And he's got the helmet on and all those types of things. So you, you've, you've seen these, these, these pictures before. We've all seen them. Well, the, the, what, what I've been told is that this, this belt of truth is key. And I think it's so key that that's why it's mentioned first. It's mentioned first. It says the belt of truth is one of the first items of our arsenal. Belt holds the other pieces of clothing and armor together. It secures the outfit and allows a soldier to move freely. Okay, so this, this idea, and you've probably seen that. You've seen, you've seen policemen, today's policemen, for example. And the one thing that, that they have, and it seems like it's so uncomfortable, is they have this big belt around them. And on this belt is hanging all kinds of things. They've got handcuffs on it, and they've got their baton on it, and they've got probably their mace on it, and their, their gun is hanging off of it. They've got probably 15 pounds of things that are hanging on this belt. Well, this, this, this belt during the time of the, the Romans that Paul is writing this is that this is a belt that basically pulls kind of everything together. You can imagine that your breastplate and some of your other pieces of equipment are going to fasten onto this as well. It's going to keep them, keep them secure. It says that um, the commentary, this is a commentary by um, um, uh, Grison, um, and it says this, it says, when we live with honesty and integrity, the other pieces of our armor, what, what could be considered our spiritual selves, stay intact. A life of integrity is not easily torn asunder. And I, I like it that this belt is called the belt of truth. The belt of truth. And remember, this is a description, not a prescription. So the idea is this, is that first of all, you need to know the truth. See, if you don't know the truth, it's easy to be deceived. But if you know the truth, it's very, very, almost impossible to be deceived if you know the truth. Because people can tell you all kinds of things. But if you happen to know the truth, if you were in my sermon, remember, last, last couple of weeks, we talked about eyewitness news, remember? Eyewitness news. And what I said is this, is that the Bible is written by eyewitnesses. They saw Jesus. It was like John, for example, when he's, when he's writing his gospel, when he's writing his epistle, um, he's talking about the Jesus that not only he spent three years with, but he saw, he's, he's, he spent time with. John was there when Jesus was up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw Jesus face shining. He saw Moses and Elijah appear alongside him. He, he saw it. You can't talk him out of it. So the idea, the very first piece of this armor of God is this, is this belt of truth. Just as a soldier needs something to kind of put it all together, it's the beginning of it, the first thing we need to understand is, is, is we need to have truth. We start with the truth. If we start with the truth, then we can build on that. If you start with partial truth, if you build on it, you're a, you know what a partial truth is also called? A lie. A lie. <laughs> Thank you, Hal. Exactly right. A partial truth is nothing more than a, than a lie. It, you, you don't have the actual truth. And you can't unlearn the truth. You can't unlearn it. That's true. Yeah, Talitha just said you can't unlearn the truth. Once you know the truth, it's there. Sometimes you'll not act on it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll know the truth and you won't pre you'll pretend like you forgot the truth, but you really don't unlearn it. So verse 14 says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. And then it says, Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So the, the, 
most commentaries, most people that will talk about this understands that the breastplate is covering what? It's covering your essential organs, right? I mean, when, when people today, when people put on armor, right? They're putting Kevlar jack jackets on and stuff like that. Policemen today, you know, have body armor and it, they don't look like a Roman soldier, right? It kind of goes even underneath their, their clothing. They, they just look a little stocky. Looks like they've gained a little bit of weight. Mm -hmm. And really, you know, you can, you can knock on it because what happens, it's, it's actually, it's a Kevlar and, it, and it, it fits to their body, but it protects their vital organs. So the idea is this is that Paul is saying, okay, after you've got the truth, what you want to do is you want to put on this, this bre breastplate of righteousness. And the description here is, is twofold. One is you want to protect your heart. You want to protect your heart. I mean, that's the main thing. I mean, you've got other organs, but there's probably no other organ more important than the heart. You want to protect your heart. And the thing is, is the Bible says that our own heart can be sometimes deceitful. It can sometimes be deceitful. So you got to be careful. You got to protect it. You got to protect it from outside influences because the heart can sometimes be deceived. And you don't want the heart to be deceived. So you're protecting your heart with this breastplate of righteousness. And the, the thing I like, again, the description is it's talking about the righteousness. Now remember, where does our righteousness come from? Our righteousness comes from Jesus Christ, exactly. The righteousness that we have is not ours at all. It actually, we, it's borrowed. It's lent to us by Jesus Christ. No matter, no matter what I do without Christ, I can't be righteous, okay? But the righteousness I have now is only because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's understanding who Jesus is. And if we truly understand who Jesus is, and we have that truth in us, that's our breastplate. That's, our, that's the righteousness that we have. It's the righteousness that we have is, is the righteousness of Jesus. Let's go on. Then it says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, I like that. I like that. The, you know, Paul, all through the New Testament, is constantly asking for people to follow him. He wants people to follow him. He wants people to be able to be bearers of, of good news. The whole idea, by the way, did you know the, the, the idea of, of being called a Christian? Of being called a Christian is actually being called a disciple. I mean, there's almost no distinction. Um, the idea of, of being called a Christian means you're, like you're a little Christ one. You're, you're, you're followers of Jesus Christ. I mean, the only reason we take on the name Christian is because we're following Jesus Christ and we're, we're following along with him. And this is what the scripture is referring to. It's refo referring, referring to the, uh, that our feet are fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. So it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that we're told. Remember when Jesus ascended, before Jesus ascended, he gave his disciples the great commission. And he says, I want you to go and, and teach all nations. I want you to take this gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I want that you to teach them all things. Everything that I've taught you, I want you to teach to them as well. That, and that's this, guy, this idea of, of our feet being fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. It's the gospel of peace. I like the idea that it's the gospel of peace. It's not the gospel of war. It's not the gospel of love. It's the gospel of peace. I mean, there's, there's love in there, absolutely, but it's the gospel of peace. Peace, Jesus, remember when, when Jesus saw his disciples after he had risen from the dead, the first things he said to them was, my peace to you. My peace to you. And Jesus also said, as I've given you peace, extend it to others as well. This, is the, this goes back to the idea of shalom, the, the Jewish idea of shalom. It's, it's being able to extend peace. So the idea is that the gospel is really bringing peace. You know, so often people sometimes think that the gospel, the gospel that we present is a harsh gospel or it's a gospel that, that confronts. It's a gospel that, that, uh, that separates good from bad, evil from, from light, or uh, darkness from light. And actually, the gospel is really best presented when it's the gospel of, of peace. You know, Jesus basically came and to do something for man that man couldn't do by himself. God, God so loved the world, it says, that he gave Jesus, okay? so that whoever believes in him would not perish. So this is a gospel of peace. It's, the, it's to bring peace to the nations. The, the angels, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, they said, peace to men of goodwill. Peace to the earth. Peace, peace on earth. Peace on earth. 
So this gospel is a gospel that brings that brings peace. The idea of this is also this when it, when it talks about the uh, the, the feet that, that bring this this peace. The idea is, is movement, and that's and that's actually where that's that separates peace from 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 um, the absence of peace. Right? Is when and is when you bring it into a situation. <clears throat> there are many people that I know that they're perfectly happy to be completely outside of the will of God. They're perfectly happy. The only time that they aren't happy is when they're confronted with the grim reality of what they actually believe, what they actually believe. Because because what happens is this is that it no longer it doesn't make any logical sense. Because they they start spinning out of control. All of a sudden they the idea of this idea of well, I, I can't believe in a God that judges. Well, why do we have courts? You know, why are why are there courts? Why are what happens if somebody Somebody has a moving violation. Do they get a ticket, or you just let them go? If somebody does commits murder, what do you do with the murderer? Is there judgment that's there? So you start confronting them with the own fallacy of their thinking, um, and that's where all of a sudden peace <laughs> has the opportunity to come in. And often it comes in, but this comes in through conflict. And that, that goes back to the very, very very beginning when we talked about that you want to start off with this belt of truth. Because here's the thing: is that the more you understand the truth. The more you pick up your Bible and the more you read this and the longer you spend time with Jesus, it becomes so overwhelmingly your focus, your point of view, what's, what's called a, a, a world vision. When you, when you see the Bible come true and when you start seeing the interaction of Jesus Christ and the gospel of peace, in the world and you see what happens when it's absent and when you see what happens to people that don't embrace it and when you see the glorious things that happen to people that do embrace it i mean my goodness all of us have our own testimonies but all of us collectively can have hundreds of testimonies of people that we know that have come to christ and their life has completely changed families have been put together husbands and wives love each other children come back again i mean when we see all these things happening we become so sure of it. Sometimes it's, it's, it's inconceivable sometimes for us to understand why people don't get on board. I mean, this, is, this seems like the, the most rational thing I've ever done was to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I mean, it's the most important thing I've ever done, but it also is the most rational thing I've ever done. It isn't a matter of faith anymore for me. This is a matter of truth. Truth transcends faith. I mean, faith is whether I want to believe it or not. Truth is there whether I believe it or not. It transcends faith. So let's go on. Um, ready to say a shield of faith, right? That's where we are. And having, I charge your feet with the preparation of the gospel of faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. I love that. I love that. You've got, you've got a defensive weapon. And the thing I like about this defensive weapon, it's mobile. <laughs> it is mobile. Because that shield of faith can protect the front. It can protect the sides. I mean, you can move it around. Regardless of who's coming after you, you can take that shield and defend yourself with it. Oh, offensively, it can be used also because you guys beat somebody in the head with a, with a shield. But and also, that, you can move the line. You can move the whole line. Yep. Yeah. No, and you're removing it within the, the, the shield of faith. Yep. The thing I like also on this is that, and this is, I, I read this on one of the commentaries, is that remember the shield of faith doesn't stop you from getting attacked. You still get attacked, but what it does is it lessens the blow. See, if the blow came to you directly without that shield of faith, it could penetrate. It could do true damage. But the idea is with the shield, it, dis it, it disperses it. So the idea is the shield is taking the, the hard force of the blow. Now, you still feel it. I mean, somebody's beating on you with an axe, and you've got a shield. It's gonna, it's gonna push you back a little bit, but it deflects it. It deflects it. It, 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 it weakens the attack, and that's the idea. Is that there's gonna be, you know, Jesus said, in this world, you're gonna have tribulations. You know, if they hated me, they're gonna hate you. There are gonna be people that are going to have to suffer and die. I mean, all of the apostles, with the exception of of John, all died a martyr's death. You know, they they understood the shield of faith. They understood what Paul was talking about. Um, but it's still a defensive weapon. It's still something that allows us to be able to get through some of those attacks, those, those fiery darts from the, from the enemy. 
as Pastor Hal was saying, is that you can move the whole line, right? right. I mean, we can move the whole line. You all can move to, you exactly right. As we want to. Together, all of us have a, a shield of faith, and we all kind of lend our our ability to defend to each other, and we can move. We can move forward. We, we can we can take we can take territory, right? We can take territory. Uh, taking the shield of faith, which we're able to quench the fiery darts, and take the helmet, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So the helmet of salvation is this, is that, you know, along with that breastplate, <laughs> the other part you want to protect is your head, your head. You know, it's interesting that our, our, our police officers today, they have that Kevlar vest and it protects their, their body, but it doesn't protect their head. You know, there's, there's, they don't have a helmet. It isn't, it isn't like in the olden days when you could put these, these helmets on with these little slits that you could kind of see through and it would protect you against swords. Um, but the idea is that, is that it's our salvation. It says this, we are assured of our eternities and made righteous recipients of peace, practitioners of faith, knowers of truth. Our minds are protected because of Jesus' work on the cross. We've been given the mind of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 2.12. A helmet can also serve as a signifier. When the enemy looks at us, he sees that we belong to Christ. And that was one of the things that was important, in, in, uh, especially in the time of the Romans, is, you know, we see that, we see these armies um, in, our, in our modern pictures, and you've got, you know, people in red and then people in blue. You know, the, you had the, the, uh, the English against the French, and the French would be in the blue and the English would be in the red, and you could always tell the enemies. You know, Civil War, for those of you that are Civil War buffs, you always have the, the boys in gray and you had the boys in blue. Well, the truth is, is that particularly when you go back to the time of the Romans, they didn't have uniforms like that. They had banners that they would fly. They would have a flag and the people that would rally around by the flag, but often, especially if you go all the way to the Crusades, people brought their own armor. They brought their own armor and they brought their own colors and they brought their own shields. And so there was all different kinds of things. So the idea is what I understood is that often the helmet would be one of the things that would distinguish the good guys from the bad guys. It wasn't so much the shield, it wasn't so much the sword, it wasn't so much everything else, but the helmet often would be able to distinguish the good guys from the bad guys, your team from the other team. And I, and I kind of like that because here's the thing. Yeah, they, they would have. Well, they would also have colors, like like oh, during the time of, during the time of, uh, of like Middle Ages and things like that. A lot of times the knights would wear a color, and the color would often be interwoven with their helmet. Okay. That's where they That's where they would have the colors. The colors would be tied around the helmet, to tied around the neck. It would be. It would be part of that 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 head covering. At least that's what I've heard. So it's kind of kind of and the thing I, the thing is is that this is group effort though and I mean that's when we're talking about an army we're talking about the I mean what, what good is one Roman soldier I mean you've got to have others with you you've got to have somebody protecting your sides and somebody protecting your back this is something for the body of Christ this too by the way the the only offensive weapon all this has been defensive by the way all up to this point we get the sword of the spirit. And the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Now remember, that's not just the Bible. That includes Jesus himself. Jesus is the Word of God. So we've got Jesus. We've got the Word of God. We've got the, the rhema and the spoken Word of God as well. So this is, this is our offensive weapon. And it allows us to, dis, to, to, uh, to be able to, to, to fight off those types of things. As the Bible says the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's out of Hebrews 4.12. So the idea is that we've got this, this Bible, this, this breath of God. Uh, we've got the word of God. And if you've ever, if you've ever found yourself being attacked, um, it, it just could be somebody that just thinks they know a little bit more than you and they want to confound you and stuff like that. The more you know of the word of God, the, the better off you're going to offend yourself. I think I told you the story when I was a brand new believer. I mean, I must, I, I was, I mean, I mean, I, 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 I was just coming back from church. I mean, I was, I mean, I literally was just coming, I was, I was a brand new believer. And we had a couple of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses come to the door. And some of the Jehovah's Witnesses are very, very nice people, but, but they're, unfortunately, they're, they're deceived. They just, they just don't understand who Jesus is. And, and the only scripture verse I could remember was out of Philippians, and it says, and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's the only scripture verse I kind of knew that had any, it was a good one, 
But it's the only one I knew. Mm -hmm. So I had to say it over and over again. So they'd say something else, and I said, but every tongue will confess, and every, every mouth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they'd say something else, and I'd say, but, but, but Jesus is Lord. Every mouth will, every t knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. And they looked at me, and they said, is that all you got? It's all I got. <laughs> that's, that's the only thing I had at the time. So. Absolutely. So the, Paul saves the very best for last because what he wants to include in this, and that's why I always want to include it in the armor of God, is the idea of prayer. In verse 18 it says, praying always. Praying always. So the idea is, is when you're girding your waist with truth and you're putting on the breastplate of righteousness and you're shotting your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace and you're taking the shield of faith and you've got the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, the word of God, while you're doing that, you better be praying, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And then Paul in verse 19 says, and remember me, pray for me as well. And one of the things, and you know, that's one of the things, you know, when we, when we started um, Celebrate Seniors a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, one of the things that God really put on my heart was the idea is that we wanted to partner with the other churches. We really wanted to partner with the churches. This wasn't just going to be, you know, who we are and the other churches were out there. We wanted to partner with the other churches, and we wanted to embrace them all. And, and we pray, as you, as you know, we, we pray for all of the churches. And this is, this is a group effort. This is a group effort. And Paul is telling us that. He, Paul is saying, remember to pray for me. You want to remember to pray for the people that are in that are leaders in the battle. You want to pray for the other churches. We're, we're one body of Christ. And, and every single church and every single pastor has struggles. And every single church and every single pastor has a, a specific calling. I always say that the local church is the expression of God's love in a community. Okay? The local church is the expression of God's love in a community. And we need them all. We didn't all. I told you the church that I was in in Nashville was a radical church, a radical church. I saw, I saw more tattoos and more piercings than I did my last NBA game. I mean, this was a radical church. We, we smoked the stage. I mean, I mean, it was going like to a rock concert, except the music wasn't quite as good and it was darker. I mean, it was just, it was, it was crazy. But we were reaching a group of people that the other churches just weren't reaching. And I was, I was happy to be there. I was happy to be there. But we needed the local Baptist church. We needed the local Presbyterian church. We needed the local Catholic. We needed all the churches in the area because no one church can reach all of those people. There were, our, our music wasn't the same music that other people wanted to hear. They wanted to hear different kinds of music. They wanted to hear different kinds of sermons. So, so these, these local churches are the expressions of God's love in the community. So we, we pray for them. And that's what Paul's saying. He says, remember, remember me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For I'm an ambassador in chains, that, if, that, that in it I may speak boldly. And then Paul concludes this with talking about Titius. Is that right? Titius, I think it's Titius. And this, the idea is here, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, except that, again, this kind of goes to what we talked about in the last two weeks with Eyewitness News, is when this Bible is being written, Paul is writing a letter to a specific church. He's entrusting that letter to a trusted friend, and that friend is taking it, probably by, by walking or by horseback, and he's taking it from where Paul is to this local church, and he's giving it to the church. The, the integrity of the scriptures is exactly that. Paul's saying, this is Paul. This is your beloved brother. And I'm giving it to this servant. And he's going to give it to you. And he's going to bring back from you a report. Because I love you. And I want to know how, how things are going with you. And then he closes with basically a doxology. It's basically a, a, a benediction. Praise to the brethren in love with faith. From God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. The thing I like about Paul is that Paul, when he's writing this, knew he was writing the scriptures. Mm -hmm. I mean, Paul, when he started penning this, he knew God had told them that he was to write this stuff down. God was giving him inspiration, amazing inspiration. It's a little different than the inspiration that John got. You know, John in the book of Revelation, John sees an angel, and the angel says, John, write this down. Mm -hmm. Write this down. So write down what you see. Stop. 
You know, get on your feet. Stop worshiping God and write down what you're seeing. That was how, that's how John was given his revelation. Paul wasn't given revelation like that. Paul is just speaking out of his heart. But Paul, right from the very beginning, knows that he's writing a letter. It's a letter of God that not only would be shared in these churches in Ephesus, but would be passed on. There's many times in the New Scriptures he says, make sure that you take the letter that I wrote to you and share it with the other churches. In the same way, the letter I wrote to them, I want them to share it with you as well. And there is the book of Ephesians. Did you like it? Yes. This is a great book. I mean, it, it really is. We're never going to run out. We're, gonna get, we're not going to run out of books. We can always, there's always another book we can, we can read and study and learn and, and learn from. Let's pray and then be friendly and talk and share and we'll see how things are going. Father God, we want to thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this book of Ephesians as we've been reading through it over the last few weeks. We thank you. You've been listening to Faith Dialogue with Pastor Ken Baer, recorded live at Celebrate Seniors, a ministry of Faith Dialogue. You can listen to or watch all of the recordings at Faith Dialogue by going to www.faithdialogue.org.